Hi, my name is Mary Zanarini, and today I'll be talking about levels of acceptance and forgiveness reported by borderline patients and access to comparison subjects over 16 years of prospective follow-up. Like Carla, I have a 30-minute talk uh, that I have to give in 15 minutes, so luckily I'm a native New Yorker, so I will just speak extremely rapidly. <laughs> and it's not moving forward. Oh, there we go. My co-investigators, Francis Frankenberg and Garrett Fitzmorris, and also Brad Reisch, who's here today. And it moves forward <laughs> after about five hits. What is this? OK. Now, the pain of being borderline has long been associated with dysphoric, or borderline personality disorder has long been associated with dysphoric <laughs> affects and painful cognitions. John Gunderson and Margaret Singer in 1975 wrote a <coughs> just incredibly famous literature review about borderline patients, and they found that the, all the prior papers describe borderline patients as depressed and angry, as well as depersonalized and having brief psychotic experiences. Now, our group studied uh, dysphoria, 15, 50 interstates, characteristics of those with BPD, and taken together, the results of this study suggest, and my co-investigator was uh, Christine DeLuca, that the subjective pain of borderline patients may be both more pervasive and more multifaceted than previously recognized. Spend a lot of time being upset and a lot of different feelings of being upset at the same time. And the overall amplitude of this pain may be a particularly good marker for the borderline diagnosis. Now, <coughs> I'm going to be describing a little bit more about longitudinal results. And Ian Reed, who's here today, this was his program of research when he was uh, a postdoctoral student of mine. Borderline patients reported decreasing percent of the time spent experiencing dysphoric affects and cognitions over 10 years of prospective <coughs> follow-up, which is good news. However, borderline patients continue to report higher <laughs> levels of time experiencing these affects and cognitions and access to comparison subjects, not surprising and not discouraging either. In a positive interstates, Ian also found that, at a baseline study, found that positive affect and cognitive states were more common among access to comparison subjects than patients with BPD. Again, not a surprise. He found that these baseline findings were also found after 10 years of prospective follow-up However, these states increased in frequency over time for those in both groups. And he looked at all 50 positive states found on a measure we call the positive affective scale or affect scale, which should have been called the positive interstate scale, but um, I didn't know that until John Gunderson pointed that out to me. And also was a 50-item self-report measure, assesses positive affective and cognitive interstates, and each item assesses the percentage of the time that a subject has felt or thought that way in the past month. Now, why am I bothering to study acceptance and forgiveness, which is a smaller bit of the work that Ian did? First of all, I think it's very difficult for borderline patients to achieve acceptance and forgiveness, as it means giving up the hurt and disappointment of the past and believing painfully, as we all recognize as we look at our lives as adults, believing that one's life could only have unfolded as it did. We may have wished for something different, but it was what it was. Now, there have been two prior studies of acceptance and forgiveness that I was able to find. Marcia Lenahan's lab found that experiential avoidance, sort of the opposite of acceptance, decreased significantly more in those treated with DBT than those in her community treatment by experts group. And Randy Sansone, Kelly, and Forbes found that numerous aspects of forgiveness have significantly lower scores in a self-report measure among those with BPD traits than among other patients in a large internal medicine outpatient practice. Now, this, these results will be from the McLean Study of Adult Development, the first NIMH-funded prospective study of the longitudinal course of BPD, started with 362 McLean inpatients, assessed at baseline, with about a six-day inpatient stay, Eight ways of blind follow-up are complete, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and 16-year data. 18 and 20-year waves are 99% complete, or 99.9% .9 complete. We're still running down some stragglers. And the 22-year wave began in June of 2015. Now, our subjects are 290 patients being DIBOR and DSM-3R criteria for BPD, and 72 access to comparison subjects being DSM-3R criteria for another personality disorder, but neither study criteria is set for BPD, 
what is the DIB-R, the Revised Diagnostic Interview for Borderlines? It means you have to have symptoms in each of the four domains of borderline psychopathology at the same time. Affects, cognitions, behaviors, relationships. There's no specializing in one or two areas. And it results in a somewhat smaller but more homogeneous group of patients uh, than the DSM criteria, although it would be similar to the DSM criteria if you had seven, eight, or nine items. Now, our retention rate has been very high. 88% of surviving borderline patients with BPD are still participating, and 83% of surviving access to comparison subjects are still participating. Now, the interstates we studied were accepting of the past, that I can accept myself, that I've forgiven those who've hurt me, and that I've been able to forgive myself. So two items looking out and two items looking in. And I'm going to not really spend any time on these figures because they're remarkably similar, and so I'm going to whiz through them. But as you can see, the borderline patients in blue are beneath the OPDs in red, and this is the percent of time that I felt accepting of the past, percent of the time that I can accept myself, percent of the time that I've forgiven those who've hurt me, percent of the time that I've been able to forgive myself. And what does this mean? Borderline patients had significantly lower baseline scores on these four positive cognitions. Increasing scores for OPD were not significant. They pretty much were stable. Increasing scores for borderline patients were highly significant, typically by a factor of about two. And borderline patients improved on these four cognitions at a steeper rate than OPDs. Now, this is non-recovered borderline patients versus recovered. And recovered borderline patients, in our definition, are those with concurrent symptomatic remission, good social functioning, and good full-time vocational functioning. And that breaks down to 60 40 percent, with more people being recovered than non-recovered. You can see the non-recovered are beneath the recovered, and we'll whiz through them just as we did before. A percent of the time that I felt accepting of the past, percent of the time that I could accept myself, <laughs> percent of the time that I've forgiven those who've hurt me, percent of the time that I've been able to forgive myself. Now, what do these results mean? Recovered borderline patients had significantly higher baseline scores on these four positive uh, cognitions by a factor of about two, and increasing scores for those in both groups were significant. However, recovered and non-recovered borderline patients improved on these four cognitions at similar or parallel rates. Now, this is a three-group comparison of non-recovered borderline patients in blue, recovered borderline patients in red, and OPDs in green. And what we can see is that the recovered borderline patients and OPDs are quite similar in being able to forgive myself and the other three mature positive cognitions, and both groups are quite different than the non-recovered borderline patients. Now, in fact, recovered borderline patients were lower at baseline than the OPDs 33 percent of the time versus 53 percent of the time, but about the same at 16-year follow-up, in fact, a little higher, 67 percent versus 62 percent. Now, what were our main findings? Borderline patients reported mature positive cognitions involving acceptance and forgiveness less often than OPD subjects at baseline. However, these rates improved dramatically over time for those in the borderline group, but not the OPD group. Non-recovered borderline patients reported mature positive cognitions involving acceptance and forgiveness less often than recovered subjects at baseline. However, these rates improved significantly over time for those in both groups. And borderline patients were very similar to access to comparison subjects over time. And in conclusion, borderline patients, particularly those who have recovered, are able to increasingly accept and forgive others, and slightly less often themselves, often recognizing that they've not just been hurt by others, but they've, in a way, inadvertently hurt others as well. So that's my talk. I don't know how fast it was. Okay, questions? Discussion? Stephanie asked if I've linked these outcomes or predictors, if you want to look at them that way, to other important outcomes, and we haven't yet. We've just started this part of our program of research, really feeling like 
we spend so much time talking about the dysphoria of borderline patients, even though we recognize 60% have recovered, that we sort of don't pay attention to how much growth they've achieved in the areas of acceptance and forgiveness, which are hard for all of us. Many of us, when we were younger, weren't so good at accepting some things and maybe weren't the world's most forgiving people either. And it comes with age, wisdom, time, and and the ability to grieve. And let me just say that the affect I think borderline patients are most busy fleeing from is sorrow, because sorrow really acknowledges that you've had important relationships, things haven't worked out, and that there's something to grieve over. And many borderline patients who I've treated, um, after they've started the grief process, really wish that they hadn't held on to their bitterness for so long but it started the grieving process earlier because it frees them up so much and it acknowledges that the parents who they're railing against sometimes really were people they were deeply attached to or having trouble separating from because while many borderline patients, some borderline patients have had really horrific childhood experiences, many have had average expectable parents who just didn't know their child was sick or their child was suffering, they thought she was simply misbehaving, which obviously is not true. Any other questions? I have a question. Hi. Yes, hi. Do you um, have any thoughts about sort of acceptance and forgiveness by sort of mediating some kind of improvement or potentially the other way around, if you're feeling a bit better, if you're in an easier place to forgive yourself and others? So are you asking which comes first, recovery? or these states. That also is a good <laughs> thing we haven't looked at. Let me think about it clinically. Um, I would imagine forgiveness and acceptance are on the, it, they're moving with people on their way toward recovery. But once you're recovered, you both are more in touch with this, but you, it also isn't quite as important anymore because you've filled your life with appropriate other adults so that you, also that gives you more time and room really to forgive your parents and to accept yourself because also as you start to have your own children, what seemed like, oh, I couldn't believe she did that. And then you notice, oh my God, I'm doing it too. And like every other mother in my play group is doing it too. So there's a lot to be said for um, looking at more positive, more adaptive, more mature things, not always looking under a rock for every last lousy thing we can find about these patients. Yes? Um, two questions. I'm just wondering about the mechanism for uh, acceptance and forgiveness, or whether what the, did all these uh, patients receive the same treatment? Were they in treatment? I, wasn't, I didn't get that. And were there differences within the groups that why one, some of the patients were more able to you know, uh, respond with acceptance and forgiveness and others not, you know, in terms of other clinical factors that might be relevant to these, these patients very much, both groups actually, stay in non-intensive psychotherapy over a 16-year period. Not that many stop, and they don't stop for more than one two-year period, and then they go back. Um, and this treatment is not done by experts, it's not DBT, it's not MBT, it's mostly supportive psychotherapy. And why some people achieve this and why they don't, we need to look at that. How much adversity separated these, well actually I know for recovery, it turns out in the one minute I have left I'll quickly say this, that um, basically childhood adversity does not predict recovery. Um, whether it was so long ago and far away that it doesn't, or whether it's really what we have found predicts recovery, which is your own inner temperament and competence that predicts recovery. It's not what other people did to you or didn't do for you. It's what you brought to the table temperamentally and in terms of your level of competence and resilience. So thank you very much. <laughs>